good to welcome you here. Um, if you're new visiting, my name's Richard, one of the pastors here at CCC. And um, try and now cast your minds back to what was just read for us. Um, it, it's, it's rather heavy, isn't it? Um, Exodus chapter 12. Um, and we're going to set our hearts and minds on it because God has important things to teach us about Easter um, over the next uh, couple of minutes. Kids, I'm going to start by asking you a question. What does it mean to have a substitute? What does substitution mean? Anybody want to shout something out at me? Yeah, Dan. Oh, there's a good, he even gave me an example, yeah? The real teacher, there's a teacher who's on leave, then what happens? You've got a substitute teacher who comes in, very, very nice. So do you see there, it's, it's something taking the place of another, hey? So there's a great example of a substitute teacher. Can anybody give me other examples? Where else do we see substitution taking place? Yeah, classic. I knew that one was going to come up first. The rugby field, right? And, and, And why on the rugby field? What happens? Definitely. If you're hurt or if you're out of breath, you need to be taken off the field. Somebody new needs to be brought in. Where else? And I put my growth group on the spot. It's one of my favorite pastimes, and you would have benefited from uh, our last growth group meeting. Starts with B and ends with Rownies. (laughs) Where else do you see substitution taking place? It's the only other example I could think of. Baking, right? Baking. Now, is bakers amongst us? Substitution? Why would substitution happen within baking? Can you think? Adults, you can chip in. Allergies, right. Yeah, exactly. So somebody's gluten intolerant, you've got to take that wonderful, refined, white, gluten-filled stuff, put it to one side, and then find some kind of cauliflower, ground-up thing (laughs) that gets substituted into its place, right? A substitution is something that takes the place of something else. And, And in our true story from the Bible this morning, we're going to learn about the greatest substitution that we could ever ever dream of, and, and a swap, because that's what substitution means, a swap, the greatest swap that we could ever have, and something that we really need. So I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to jump into Exodus chapter 12. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this passage. Thank you that you have kept these words for us. Please, we ask, will you help us to understand what they mean for us this morning? And we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we make sure that we have all made this swap today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so the substitution that we're going to be thinking about and what we're learning about um, here in in Exodus chapter 12 happened a very long time ago. So these words were written some over 3,000 years ago. And, And it's so important, this chapter, because if we understand Exodus chapter 12, we actually understand the rest of the flow of the whole storyline of the Bible. The substitution here in Exodus 12 is just a little picture of something that God will do on a much bigger scale. He had a much bigger swap planned. Okay, so there's the spoiler for the day. There's something much bigger that this story here in Exodus chapter 12 is going to push us to. It's so important here in the story, here in Exodus chapter 12, that God says to the Israelites, they need to reset their calendars. That this meal that they're about to have, this celebration that they're about to have, is going to be the start of their new year. Because he wants them to celebrate and remind themselves of what God has done. Uh, so what do we do on New Year's, kids? What often happens at New Year's at your house? Or you go somewhere? What, what normally happens? Well, it depends on your parents, actually, to be really honest. Uh, but <laughs> does anything happen at your house on New Year's Eve? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, you stay up. Yes, you stay up till midnight to kind of welcome the New Year in. Normally, what do you do in the evening while you wait? What are some of the things we do? I heard it, eat. We eat, we we normally eat, we eat some good food, we have a braai, we'll bake brownies, you know, we'll have something really nice and special for for the evening. And then what happens at midnight? What do you hear going on all around Maritzburg? Bang, explosions, right? There's a celebration, right? Everyone welcomes in the new year. Israel, Israel called to celebrate. This is a massive celebration for them, the start of their new year. The question is, though, What are they celebrating? It's a meal that's called the Passover. What what are they celebrating? What does God want them to remember? And what does God want us to remember as we think back to Exodus 12? This has been saved for us so that we too will think through these things. Well, there's loads in the passage. We're not going to be able to cover all of it. 
But there's two things. There's two really important things that God wants these people and us to remember. Here's the first one, verse 12. He says, I will pass through the land, that's God, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, both people and animals. I am the Lord. I will execute judgments against all the gods of Egypt. Those are very hard verses to read, aren't they? Very, very hard. The people of Israel are to remember the punishment that God had sent here on the Egyptians. The question we've got to ask ourselves is why? Why is God punishing these people? Well, the answer is because Pharaoh and the Egyptians had refused to listen to God. And they'd refused God's word that that had come to them through the prophet Moses. They'd refused to let God's people go. Israel had been slaves to the Egyptians for over 400 years. They've been treated terribly, and so God warns Pharaoh, and he warns the Egyptians. And he he does it as early on as chapter 4, verse 22 to 23. I think I've got it there on the screen. He says this, Israel is my firstborn son. I told you, let my people go so that he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go. Look, I am about to kill your firstborn son. So Pharaoh, Pharaoh just means he was the king of Egypt. So he was the, the ruler of the place. And, and he was worried. He was really worried about the, the, the Israelites, these people. God was keeping his promises that he had made way back in Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 17. He made big promises to a man called Abraham that he would bless Abraham's family and turn them into a massive nation. And that becomes the Israelites. God always keeps his promises. If he says he's going to do something, he always does it. But the Israelites are scared because now that, uh, sorry, the Egyptians are scared because the Israelites are growing more and more and they're worried that they're going to overtake the people of Egypt. And so Pharaoh made them into slaves. He treated them horrifically. He even came up with a plan early on in Exodus, we read of this, where he killed, he tried to kill all the baby boys in Israel to try and keep their numbers down to stop the nation growing, but he couldn't do it because you can't stop God's plans. Now, the question is, how how do you think God felt about the way his people were being treated? How did he feel about what Pharaoh was doing? He wasn't happy at all. Did you see verse 22? Sorry, just back, back a little bit there. God calls the people of Israel his firstborn son, that he cares for them, that they belong to him. And so God warns Pharaoh that the same judgment will fall on Egypt. If they don't let the people of Israel go, he will kill the firstborn son of the Pharaoh. And even if that's, even if that's hard for us to hear, and we might have questions about that, and if you have questions about that, come chat to me afterwards. Do you see how the judgment fits the crime here? A son for a son. The Passover meal was a reminder to the people of Israel that God is God. God is God, and that he will judge his enemies. But it's not as if God just suddenly lashes out. He gets a fit of rage. He suddenly lashes out at at Pharaoh and the Egyptians. This judgment comes after a long process of him warning and warning the Egyptians and warning the Pharaoh. There's mountains of grace that God shows to the Pharaoh and to the people of Egypt. Uh, He sent nine plagues that demonstrated that he is God. He is the true and living God. Don't mess with me. You cannot, you cannot save Egypt on this route, on this path. If you keep going, judgment is coming. Let my people go. And yet over and over and over again, the Pharaoh doesn't listen, refuses to listen. Pharaoh, we're told, hardens his heart and made the lives of the people of Israel even worse until finally this last plague in Exodus chapter 11 and 12, this last plague of death is sent as a punishment for repeatedly ignoring the instruction of God, refusing to listen to him. And so this Passover meal, as I said a little bit earlier, is a reminder to Israel that God is God. And, and the book of Exodus is kind of set up like that. It's this, it's this big battle, if you like, between the God of the Israelites, 
versus the Pharaoh, and the Egyptians viewed the Pharaoh, the king, as a deity, as a god, and they had a whole bunch of other gods. And so there's kind of this, this battle that is ensuing. That's how you can kind of read the book of Exodus, the battle between the one true God and all these other gods of the Egyptians. And yet we see here that Pharaoh and the gods of the Egyptians are absolutely powerless. God will always do what he says. You can't ignore him forever. He won't tolerate disobedience forever. And so he judges because he is a just God. And he judges rightly. He will punish people for what their sins deserve. Now, our kids have been enjoying a holiday club this week, hence why the place is decorated like, sorry guys, this isn't all decorated for you today. Um, We've had a wonderful week with our our kids. And um, kids, you guys have been learning this in the same story in the book of Exodus, what sin is. And we see sin is a three-letter word, S-I-N, and we saw that those three letters are an easy way for us to remember what, what sin means. Can, can any of you remember what does S stand for? Shove off God. Yeah, we say shove off God. We don't, we don't want you. Okay, what does I stand for? I'm in charge. That's right. I will do what I want to do. Thank you very much. And at the back there, N? Yeah. No to your rules. No to your rules. Exactly. No to your rules. And this is how... Pharaoh and the Egyptians lived. They didn't listen to God. They thought that they were in control, and they certainly didn't want to listen to God's instruction, which is to let the people go. But remember I said earlier that the story here in Exodus chapter 12 points to something bigger, something greater, something on a much grander scale. The Bible teaches us actually that all people, all people, every single one without exception, we are all sinners. All people don't like to listen to God's rules. They want to live their own way. And because of that, we don't love God. We don't listen to him. We want to do our own thing. And it also means that we we don't love each other the way we should. That's how we see it reflected. So why did the Egyptians treat the Israelites in such a horrible way? Why is it that we see so much war in the world and so much hatred and violence and terrible things that go on? Why 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 does it happen? Because we don't listen to God. He calls us to love people, but we don't do it. And so... Because the people want to be the boss of their own lives, they clash with one another. And that's what we kind of see here in Exodus 12. And so this Passover meal is a very serious reminder that God is God and that he is going to bring right judgment for people's sin. And this is true for us too. Have a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. Paul is writing, the apostle Paul is writing, and he says, For we must all appear before where? The judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Do you see that? God will repay what people deserve because he is, a, he is a right judge. He does what is good. He'll give people what they deserve. We're told in the Bible that God sees everything. He knows everything. Even the secrets of our hearts, he knows. And we're told that he's going to bring the whole world to account. Everything that is wrong with the world, he is ultimately going to sort out one day. Isn't that a wonderful thing? It really is. All that is bad, everything that causes any kind of pain, he's going to deal with and get rid of. Only what is good will remain. That is a great hope. And so we have nothing to worry about if we're good. But what's the problem? Are any of us good? Really? Who is perfectly good? Who listens to God and obeys him every single day? Who is always kind? Who is someone who always loves, who's always selfless? None of us. We're so often grumpy, hard-hearted, wanting to do our own thing. Well, the Egyptians definitely were people that were sinful, that didn't want to listen to God. But did you know the Israelites weren't any better? In the nine plagues leading up to this final judgment that God sends on the Egyptians, he had made a distinction between Israel and Egypt. The plagues didn't affect Israel. They, they, they lived in a land called Goshen. You might have remembered that name as it was read for us a little bit earlier. And there they were protected. But they weren't protected because they deserved it. I don't have it on the screen for you. But Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 8 tells us that the people of Israel were just as bad as the Egyptians. We're told that they worshipped the idols of the Egyptians. And they also treated each other terribly too. And so we, sin, we see sin played out in, the, in their lives. And so it's not that he 
kept them safe because they were good and the Egyptians were bad. No, 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 he's doing something different there. He draws a line of distinction, but it's not on their goodness. Have a look at what God says in 11 verse 4. This is what the Lord says. About midnight, I'll go throughout Egypt. And every firstborn male in the land of Egypt will die. Notice from where? From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on the throne, to the firstborn of who? Servant girl, the Israelites, who is at the grindstone, as well as the firstborn of the livestock. And chapter 12, verse 22 to 23, it says, none of you, that is the, the Israelites, none of you may go out your door until morning. The biggest problem that the Israelites and the Egyptians have, but the Israelites have, is, is not actually safety from the Pharaoh. Pharaoh actually isn't their greatest enemy. They are told that they can't go outside. And why can't they go outside? Because God is coming. God is a greater enemy than Pharaoh. And so there was danger for everyone on that first Passover night in Exodus chapter 12. The question is why? Well, because all people are sinners. And that night, the Lord was coming to pass through Egypt. And because he is perfect, and people are not, they cannot see God. They cannot be with God and live. He is too holy. He is too pure. He is too majestic. Like the sun, as you look out at the sun, not much sun shining out at the moment. When the sun shines in all its brilliance here in Maritzburg, and you can't touch your feet on the tar because it's so hot. God, he is so pure. He is so holy. We don't stand a chance if we stand before him because we are unholy. We cannot be in his presence and live. But... Okay, if you're all having a little panic, this is where it starts to shift. But, but praise be to God, that doesn't mean there isn't any hope. This meal shows us that God rightly judges, but it also shows us, secondly, that he mercifully saves. You would have heard it in the reading, but Moses commands the people. He gets instruction from God, and then he, he commands the elders uh, of the people to go and speak to everybody in, in, in Israel, and every single family is to go and to slaughter a lamb. It was meant to be an unblemished lamb. Um, that means a lamb that is the, the best one that they had. It couldn't be a sickly lamb. It needed to be one of their good ones. And then they had to kill the lamb. And then what they had to do is take the blood, and they had to smear it. First, on the lintel, and then on their doorposts. Every single house in Goshen needed to have this. Why did they need to do that? Have a look at verse 23. What does God say to them? When the Lord passes through to strike Egypt, and sees the blood, sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, he will pass over that door and not let the destroyer enter your houses to strike you. Did you know that on that first Passover night, there was not a house in Egypt and in Goshen where there wasn't death present? For the Egyptians, it was their firstborn sons who died. But for Israel, it was the lamb. Because God had provided a substitute. A lamb had died so that Israel's firstborns could live. One takes the place of the other. Judgment falls on that lamb and it pays the price that people deserve. And like I said earlier, this is just a little picture of a much greater substitute that would come. Because the truth is an animal, a lamb, it can't really take away the sins of people. It isn't a good swap. I made a joke a little bit earlier about cauliflower flour. It's not a great swap, right? It tastes as good. Same is true here. It's not actually a really good swap. It's a picture to a better swap that was on the way, a better substitute. And not just anyone, it wasn't just anyone, the perfect one. 
Someone who does listen to God was on the way. Someone who obeys God's rules, somebody who loves God perfectly was on the way. And who's that? Jesus. Jesus. Well done, Sheena. (laughs) Have a look at John chapter 1, verse 29. John is a prophet that God sends, and he sends he sends John to Israel to his big job was to announce the substitute was coming for everybody to see. And he looks at Jesus. John sees Jesus and he shouts out, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God loves the world so much that even though we act like Pharaoh and the Egyptians and the Israelites, even though we deserve judgment, he sends the firstborn of all creation, we're told. God's son comes into the world to be like that unblemished lamb. Here, then, is the greatest substitute. And did you hear it a little bit earlier? As we were reading the the gospel account, Kate Kate was reading about what happened in Jesus' trial. There was the innocent one, and who went free? Can anybody remember the name of the one who went free? Barabbas. And Barabbas wasn't a nice guy. He was a murderer, insurrectionist. But there was Jesus, the innocent, who goes to be judged, and Barabbas goes free. It's a picture of that swap. And using that language of 1 Corinthians, it's not going to come up on the screen again, but you remember there was that language of we will be repaid as you stand before that judgment seat of Christ, we'll be repaid for the good or the bad we have done. Well, because of Jesus and the substitute, the substitute, we'll be repaid what Jesus deserved. We will only be repaid good because he was the good one. And on him, he takes what we deserved. Well, the question is, where did that happen? Where did that happen? Can you guys guess? Kids? Jesus gives up his body and his blood for us, for you. And just like the Israelites were given that lamb, that lamb to slaughter, but then also they were told to eat the lamb, they had to eat it as a family, Jesus gave his disciples a meal to eat. And we're going to celebrate that sign a little bit later as we have the Lord's Supper, as we celebrate communion. But he says this in John chapter 6 and verse 54 to 56. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has what? Eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day because my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Well, that sounds a little bit gory. He's not actually saying we go eat him and drink him. He's not saying that at all. He's making a point here that we are to trust him, believing that he is the sacrifice that we need. And just like the Israelites had to go out and paint the the lintel and the doorpost with the blood, what do we have to do? We run to Jesus. We trust him. We come to him. We take refuge in him because he was sacrificed in our place, the greatest swap. It's true that 2,000 years ago, this Jesus came And this was the most horrific and barbaric act in all of human history. The perfect one, nailed to a cross. He did nothing wrong, and he died a sinner's death, and a painful one at that. Absolutely horrific that his blood was spilt. But even though it was a horrific day, have a look how Peter, the apostle Peter, describes Jesus' blood. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life. That is his language for we were walking away from him. We didn't want to listen to him. Your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, is something that passes on from generation to generation, all of us. And how are you redeemed? Not with the perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious, the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. What man f- meant for evil on that day, as Jesus hung there on the cross, God used for great good for our good. It makes it a precious gift. And that's what today is. We started the service by thinking about what, what, what makes today a good Friday. That makes today the best Friday. 
So the question is, have you received it? Have you received it? Have you, like the Israelites, taken refuge under the blood of the Lamb? Like with Pharaoh, God shows us mountains of grace, doesn't he? As you look over the, if you look over, just backward over your life, how kind God is. He doesn't judge disobedient people straight away. He's very kind. He waits for us. But this passage tells us he, doesn't, he won't ignore our disobedience forever. And yet he has provided this wonderful substitute for you. Wonderful. Jesus' life was given for you. Come to the foot of the cross and take refuge. Trust in this Jesus with your failings and he will wash you clean. That's what he promises. And if you've done that, let today be a reminder of the depths of our sin. We are fallen people like the Israelites, like the Egyptians. And yet, be reminded of the deeper love of God, the grace that he has shown to us in sending his son to die in our place. John chapter 3, verse 16, we'll end with this. For God, for God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life.